Um, I think that's Liz anyway. Let me just make sure. Oh, I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna mute. Um, I'm gonna allow you to mute everybody, Neil. Okay. Okay, you are now the host. So you should be able to at the bottom, you'll see a share your screen. You should be able to share your screen and select the PowerPoint. Yep, I just want to make sure. Okay, and then over on the right, if you can see all your participants, can you select participants and bring up the participant screen? Manage participants, yep. Okay, and then you should be able to find a mute all button. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then Vicki will be able to unmute herself or you can unclick Vicki's uh, microphone in order. However, I don't see your screen yet. Nope, not yet. Okay. Okay, Vicki, you there? I am. Can you hear me? I can. All right. <clears throat> Okay, can you see my screen, Vicki? I can, you're good. Is it, the, is it the PowerPoint? Yep, you got it. Okay, well, wonderful. Thank you everybody for joining us. My name is Neil Deagleman. I'm an associate at the Law Offices of Melissa A. Day. We're here today with uh, my friend, Vicki Bueller, who's also an associate uh, with the LOMAD office. Um, we've both been with LOMAD for, um, I would say 11 months. Actually, I know yep. the date next month. <laughs> um, so this is going to be a fun, uh, hopefully fun for everybody, uh, overview of the medical treatment uh, guidelines. Neil, just one, um, one issue before you get started. You sure. want to launch the PowerPoint. So up at the top, you'll see from beginning. That would make more sense. <laughs> and now you'll click to advance your screens. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, again, we're going to be here today uh, talking about the new medical treatment guidelines for asthma. And here's some great tunes. Things keep changing, and never for the best, at least not for you. Rearranging rules that we cannot contest. Treatment Guidelines, Occupational and Work-Related Asthma. Thank you again for joining us. I like that jingle, actually, Vicki. That was, is, how long have we had that? Was that, do we have that last month? Yeah, we did. We I did. like it. I like I it, too. We should put it on more often. <laughs> Quick thanks to Leah Zakari, who wrote and recorded that song for us. We appreciate it. So here's, a, here's something interesting. When will the medical treatment guideline go into effect? Uh, as of December 10th, 2020, uh, 
the board in its wisdom made the release an effective date to be determined. By wisdom, we mean that very sarcastically and just like labor market attachment at this point, we have no idea when they're actually going to put these into effect. So it does say that the MTGs will be effective on the launch date of onboard limited release, which is part of the board's um, revamping of their systems, but still that's not for a time away. So they originally were going to be in January of 2021, but not anymore. So as with the other medical treatment guidelines, <coughs> does my arrow show up? Um, with the other medical treatment guidelines, uh, they have the general guideline principles, which we're not going to go over to go over uh, today because they really are just the same um, guiding principles of you know what the medical care, what the standards of medical care should be, initial evaluation. I'm not saying that it's not something that um, should be reviewed every so often because it is useful to make sure that you're aware of what's required generally under the medical treatment guidelines, but they are unchanged. And I think Vicki, you looked at them too and you didn't see any changes, right? I did, and I'm pretty sure the board is cutting and pasting them at this point. So <laughs> I agree they are important, but for our purposes, they are the same as they have been in all of the MTGs we've gone over before now. Excellent. So not, in, not surprisingly, we have uh, the New York State Workers' Compensation Board and Workers' Compensation Law uh, definitions. Um, so here, asthma is a common chronic disorder of the airways that involve a complex interaction of airflow, obstruction, bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and underlying inflammation. So in the, the next three definitions we see um, the top one is work-related asthma, and that encompasses the other two. So work-related asthma is symptoms of asthma that begin or become worse at work, usually in the context of exposure to a new chemical or environmental change. And after that, they break it down, occupational asthma. That, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Neil, I think that's when there's a new onset of asthma in the workplace, which is usually caused by exposure to something that either irritates or sensitizes the claimant and results in asthma. Right, yeah, that is correct. I just wanna, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so with occupational, I'm sorry, just one second. Okay. That's easier. Sorry, I needed to change my view. <laughs> okay. um, so with occupational asthma, um, oops, I didn't define the other one. Um, and work exacerbated asthma. So again, you have work-related asthma, which is at the top, and then it's broken down into occupational asthma and work exacerbated asthma, which occurs in individuals with existing concurrent asthma that worsens because of a specific workplace exposure. And here's where I was jumping ahead a little bit with the, the next slide, is then occupational um, asthma is broken down even further um, with occupational with latency and occupational asthma without latency and <clears throat> away with latency, meaning, you know, over time is seen in all instances of immunological uh, mediated asthma sensitizer. And we need to define what a sensitizer is. And the board says a sensitizer are agents that irritate, initiate an allergic response. So that's the definition of a sensitizer um, and with, with latency. And from there, the sensitizers can be divided into high and low molecular weight uh, chemicals. And there's a table, down, table one that actually breaks it down for you, as you can see on here. So high molecular weight tends to be things like grains, uh, flowers, animal proteins, latex. That may be useful for those of you who have cases involving healthcare workers. Uh, the lower molecular weight are things like cleaning agents, wood dust, uh, plastic dyes, adhesive resins things that you know people on a factory floor might be more exposed to, cleaning services, chemical production workers, things like that. 
And it's interesting, it's nice to know that, um, you know, when I first was reading this, let me say, I thought maybe there was a difference between a high and low. So Vicky, is there a difference if a high molecular, does that mean it's more likely to be prevalent and a low molecular is more likely to be less prevalent? I did the same thing, but no, it is not. They're, when they say low molecular, they actually are talking about, as far as I can tell, the molecules. They're not talking about whether or not they, you know there's a higher chance or a lower chance of this occurring and causing problems. Okay, and that makes sense. So we have um, OA without latency, and that can occur after exposure to irritant gas, fumes, chemicals, such as nitrogen oxide, ammonia, or chloride. So this is something that is, again, it would be without latency, so it would happen presumably right away. And then the other category, again, under work-related asthma, so is the work-exacerbated asthma. And that occurs in workers with existing concurrent asthma that worsens because of specific workplace exposures to irritants. And that is things like gases, fumes, vapors, and we'll talk more about that as we go on. Yeah. So asthma is basically a disease of airway inflammation reactivity. So it's not necessarily the lungs per se. It is the airway leading to the lungs. It gets inflamed, closes up, and people have problems breathing. Most major symptoms are things like shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing. Basically, your quintessential asthma attack, that is what you're probably thinking of. And that's probably the primary symptoms you're going to see for occupational asthma. Right. So it's important to establish a diagnosis of work-related asthma. And uh, this is taken from the American College of Chest Physicians, published in 1995, but apparently adopted by the board's medical treatment guidelines. Um, so here it's a history compatible with occupational asthma, presence of airflow limitation and its reversibility, in the absence of airflow limitation, the presence of nonspecific airway hyperresponsiveness, and a demonstration of work relatedness of asthma by objective means. So that's the requirements from the American College of Chest Physicians that the board seems to adopt in the medical treatment guidelines. Um, Vicki, did you see any further explanation in the guidelines regarding any of those? Uh, I, I think that you know what you went over is really it, and I'm sure that we are all shocked absolutely shocked that the board found something they could use and then basically use that to define all of their uh, criteria here. Um, some other things to think about <clears throat> are complimation, comorbid conditions relevant to work. So uh, this is a good one. Asthma might trigger a chronic cough that would then cause hoarseness that interferes with somebody's job in the sense that their voice changes or their ability to carry on a conversation is impacted. Uh, and unsurprisingly, the medications that someone may need for the asthma, the bronchodilators, may cause GERD, the gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease, basically. Uh, so, you know, it's something to keep in mind and be aware of. I mean, they also noted that vocal cord dysfunction is distinct from asthma, but could coexist uh, or triggered by GERD or exposure, exposure to irritants. So the next area that we're going to get into, Vicki and I had been going over uh, the presentation, and we feel that this is a really important section um, with regards to history taking and physical examination. We do, and I think you can tell how important it is because the board and the MTGs here have really, really broken down what they expect the doctors to do. I mean, they're looking for an occupational exposure history, they're looking for presentation, they're looking for diagnostic screening results. Um, when you look at the history of present illness, they're telling the doctor that, you know, doctor, you need to be documenting occupational and non-occupational exposures. Uh, you need to be describing the current and the past types of work activities. You need to go through the time at each job, the years, that the job was held, uh, and they're saying you have to go back to the past here. You cannot just look at the current job where this exposure has allegedly taken place. You got to look back and you got to be very, very detailed. 
Absolutely. Um, and when you're looking at exposures to grains, flowers, um, platinum salts, uh, chemicals, they give some examples um, throughout there. Um, but you, wanna, you would want the question detailing the claimant's individual responsibilities and exposure. Did you work in the office? Did you work outside? Did you work in a room with one door and no windows? Um, was it, did, you know, ventilation, things of that nature. Um, you would wanna have, make sure that the doctor inquires about the intensity of the exposure. Um, hopefully from some type of industrial hygiene data, um, or at least a qualitative, qualitative description of the industry intensity of exposure week, daily, monthly, yearly, hourly. Um, and then of course there, oh, there are the uh, subjective um, symptoms, of course. So the claimant's going to tell the doctor, oh, I have this, this started on this date, here's the symptoms that started. And the symptoms that could include tightness of uh, the throat, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, of course. The claimant would want to make sure uh, that they describe any cough or harsh breath sounds, uh, chest tightness, things of that nature. Again, these are uh, things that the claimant is then telling the doctor, but hopefully the doctor would also be eliciting from the claimant. Um, again, here it's showing the duration. Uh, changes in, in work environment, changes in symptoms in relation to days worked and not worked, so weekends and holidays, so over the weekend, sir, ma'am, did your symptoms improve? It's great, and hopefully the doctors will document this. And other things they need to be documenting are things like, did your symptoms begin after a one-time high-level workplace inhalation, uh, pulmonary imaging testing, previous treatments, that's definitely something that's gonna be very important, especially if this is supposedly an exacerbation of pre-existing asthma. Uh, and what I thought interesting, Neil, here was that they have to document their relationship to work, and that has to include a statement of the probability that the illness or injury is work-related. Past medical history, it's all going to be relevant. This didn't come to too much as a surprise to me. It seems like your standard type of questions you'd be asking a person, a doctor should be asking their smoking history, medication history, vocational and re recreational pursuits, um, obviously prior studies, imaging, surgical history. Yeah, that one was pretty straightforward, but it, yeah. it was still interesting. They're, they're specifying, you know, you should be conducting a history that includes all of these things. Right, and so it's almost, again, I, I'm almost viewing it as like a real outline for a doctor. Take these medical treatment guidelines and you can just write a report just going right through, or should be able to. Um, physical examination, of course, is very important, uh, but nothing really jumped out at me as surprising here, uh, but if there is a focus on cardiac examination, pulmonary examination, but it also includes um, your typical ease of movement, walking, changing positions, dressing and undressing, um, and uh, evaluating if during that time, uh, if there is any shortness of breath, any symptoms of shortness of breath. And something that may be useful for these, particularly if you're getting an IME, I mean, you're gonna wanna make sure your IME is addressing all of these, the past medical history, going into detail, hitting these elements for the physical exam. So you may wanna consider getting an you know, a detailed IME cover letter to send to the IME so that you can make sure that they are looking at these guidelines and they are answering these questions because that is going to be really, really relevant, particularly in terms of causal relationship, I think. You know what, Vicki, that's a really good point um, that a detailed cover letter would be the best way to have a doctor approach this as opposed to them just looking at it and trying to determine what they think is relevant and not. Okay, so in general, uh, at least one source of objective information is needed for evaluation of cases of suspected occupational asthma. So you can get information on workplace exposures from things like material safety data sheets, 
industrial hygiene data, employer records, union health, maybe uh, safety personnel information. So material safety data sheets I've actually worked with before. I've had a couple of cases I've dealt with where there was an alleged respiratory issue. Those can actually be very, very helpful because they include both the health effects information and what recommended personal protective gear. So if there is any, so like, you know, a mask, a ventilator, anything like that. Uh, and they also are supposed to be, you know, there are good guidelines to help figure out, you know, is this guy's vague symptoms, is it actually due to this exposure or, you know, could it be anything? They're, they're a good source to use also the safety personnel information. That is things like, you know, your assured safety manager, um, training manuals, policies, anything like that that they have, those can be very, very, very useful sources of information when you're looking at this. So maybe when uh, good practice is if you get a claim for this type of exposure, um, that's what type of information we'd be asking the assured to start preparing and retaining for us. Yep. Wonderful. Um, in when you're uh, the objective information, it needs to establish all known exposures in any environment to any chemicals or substances, including gases, fumes, fumes, vapors, dusts. Um, it also should identify the history of the room size, ventilation, current and past uh, PPE, coworker reports, exhaust hoods, remodeling, recent change in the process, and industrial hygiene reports. What it looks like they're looking for is just what, it sounds like the material safety data sheet would be the best way to go, um, if possible, or the, and the industrial hygiene reports. That and also talking, I think, to your safety manager. Uh, I, I had a case once where a claimant was alleging that he'd been exposed to fumes from glue. And it was actually disallowed because we were able to come in and show that, you know, he was working in a lab, he had proper ventilation, and he was using the appropriate safety equipment. And that was what I think our, our witness, employer witness, had testified to. And based on that, the judge disallowed that claim. So that kind of information is very, very relevant. Key, key information that we would need to, to secure from the assured. Um, we're not done with the claimant though, right? Right. We, still need, we still need to know a discussion of the claimant's environmental history. So the medical treatment guideline goes through and wants to know um, what exposures outside of the workplace uh, and questioning regarding their primary place of residence, including its age, location, type, remodeling history, heating, ventilation, flooring, and past water damage. They should also be questioning about hobbies, auto repair, woodworking, photography, ceramics, gardening, and I would imagine model airplanes that require the glue. Yep. <laughs> um, this is all stuff that we need to know about, that the doctors need to know about. Right, we're gonna be moving into diagnostic testing. This area of the medical treatment guidelines is, we're gonna be taking a, a heightened view because it is very specific and, um, but it doesn't seem out of the ordinary in a sense of anything specialized because it's more diagnostic testing for the asthma, which is well established. Yeah, this section did seem to go very, very um, hand in hand and follow along with existing protocols. And they actually mentioned that a couple of times. Right. Okay, so spirometry uh, in a work-related asthma, it's essential and it has four uh, potential roles when work-related asthma is a concern. In spir spirometry is your standard, and I believe, Vicki, we talked about you blow into the tube. Yep, it's if you've ever been in a hospital or had pneumonia or any of that fun stuff, basically you blow into a tube as hard as you can and it measures essentially how hard you're blowing. So they use it to determine, one, if you have asthma at all, two, to exclude other quote-unquote asthma-like conditions. And if you do have asthma present, the information they get from this kind of testing can help determine if it's work-related and also go to show how the claimant is responding to the treatment, which hopefully goes back to a return to work as soon as possible. 
which of course is the overall goal in workers' compensation and the medical treatment guidelines is to return the injured worker to work. Spirometry with bronchodilator response testing. Um, Vicki and I had talked about this earlier. This is basically where you're doing the spirometry testing before using a bronchodilator and then after and seeing if seeing the results. A variability of airflow obstruction fundamentally distinguishes asthma from other obstructive disorders. Uh, again, like I just mentioned, the comparison of before and after uh, repeated over a series of days. And asthma is confirmed by demonstrating airflow obstruction by reduction in forced expiratory volume and ratio or a positive methacholine measurements. Um, so this is it. this is the two, this is the number one tool I as I read it to di to diagnose this ad diagnose asthma. That's how I read it too. Yep. A peak expiratory flow rate PEFR. Um, this. Uh, this is defined as the maximum flow achieved during expiration breathing delivered with maximal force starting from the level at maximum and using a simple uh, portable meter, which is shown here. So uh, Vicki and I had discussed this earlier, and this, appear, this is where the person would be shown how to use it in a medical setting and then expected to use it outside of the medical setting and record the findings. Right, and the purpose for it is to confirm whether or not this is actually work-related asthma, particularly in patients who've already been found to have asthma by other methods. So it's not so much as a diagnostic tool as, well, it is, but it's also hand-in-hand -hand with causal relationship, which is suspect in a sense because it is objective evidence based upon the, heavily based upon the claimant's effort and re reliable performance of, a, of doing this. So it's up to the claimant if they're gonna try as hard as they can or should. So in other uh, words, it's really subjective evidence the board is calling objective evidence. Right. So, you know, uh, I think that something to focus on here and to keep an eye out on is to confirm with doctors whether the quote unquote objective evidence is actually matching up with what they would expect to see. Uh, particularly if there was work-related asthma and also if there wasn't. What do you think, Neil? That's exactly true. I mean, so I would, there could be a time where you, it wouldn't make sense the claimant's readings. And I think a doctor would be able to point that out. And we would be able to use that during defense of the claim. Yep. Mm -hmm. So non-specific bronchial uh, provocation test. Uh, this is when asthma is suspected. Uh, however, the spirometry was normal. So the claimant's still having symptoms, but the first line of diagnosis didn't reveal anything. So they do what it says. They provoke it to see if there's a reaction. So they use a drug, uh, cold air, exercise challenges, other challenges to see if they can get the reaction they're looking for to see you know, if there is asthma. And it can be used with other steps uh, required to establish the work-relatedness of asthma. Okay, specific immunological testing. This is pretty heady stuff. <laughs> It is. It's basically, uh, we've talked about it, and it's basically they're going to expose the injured worker to specific allergens to see if this occupational asthma is in fact caused by an immune or an allergic response versus an irritant-induced exposure. So the presence of specific antibodies, if they find that, that indicates that this is an immune response. That said, that does not necessarily mean that this is going to be causally related occupational asthma. It just says, hey, there's an immune response. So you would still need additional information to figure out if it's actually due to an exposure at work or not. And that's exactly true. So this is another diagnostic tool, but not necessarily uh, by itself for causal relationship. And I would imagine that um, hopefully 
this would be a, a specific panel of possible um, allergens that had been identified um, at work. I would hope it's not just a smattering of whatever they think. <laughs> um, however, but uh, the sensitization uh, to an agent by a specific IgE, the immunological testing, and or skin testing alone without demonstrating the work relatedness of the asthma is insufficient to establish a diagnosis of OA. And so I, that goes back to what Vicki was saying. Um, okay. So detection of the agent is specific to an allergen is accomplished by skin prick test. And uh, typically, again, these are broken down into uh, high molecular weight and low molecular weight. And as you can see by the picture, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen that before. Um, <laughs> there's two types. There's the precutaneous testing, which is the prick or puncture. And then there's the intracutaneous testing, intradermal. And, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Neil, I think the one that usually is used is the per percutaneous testing, which if anyone has had allergy tests, they remember that very well. They prick you with all sorts of stuff, and if you welt up, you're allergic. And those are called wheels. Um, the intradermal skin test, which is the second type less commonly, should be less commonly used. Intradermal skin test should be selectively used when there is a compatible or compelling history and a negative or equivocal uh, skin prick test result. And this our one. next one is an interesting one. So this is the specific inhalation challenge. This is rarely used, mainly because it has serious complications or can have serious complications, up to including fatality. So I don't know about you, Neil, I would not be very eager to try this. <laughs> I would not be eager at all. I would just hopefully say if there's a diagnosis of asthma, I, let's just treat it and move on. <laughs> and what they do is, uh, similarly to the provocation test, they are generating a specific exposure to the element that they suspect is causing the problem and they're following the subject's lung function. Again, they should be trying other methods first. Uh, this read very much to me like an absolute last resort. Absolutely. And there's few facilities that are even equipped to be able to do this. So I mean, it seems even more, more specific where you would have to go for this type of testing. Um, but as soon as I would read the uh, warning, I would probably say no as well. Yeah, me too. I jumped to the wrong slide. Uh, nitric oxide. Uh, this appears to be a measurement of a total exhaled nitric oxide and is tested for detection of uh, inflammatory signals. FENO is acknowledged to assess in pathological rather than physiological changes in asthma. Basically, I read it as um, it's another type of breath test, but they're now testing for what is exhaled, which is the nitric oxide. And as you can see, this is recommended for people with moderate to severe asthma. Uh, it's meant to monitor treatment. It's a test that needs to be very well understood by both the examiner and the clinician who's interpreting the test. So this is not gonna be for everybody. This is for your moderate to severe cases only. Now we're gonna get into management of occupational asthma. The goals here are to minimize asthma exacerbations by reducing work exposures, optimizing standard medical management with non-work environmental control measures and pharmacological treatment. The medical management is, includes early diagnosis, early avoidance of further exposure. Uh, these offer the best chance of avoiding further jeopardizing the asthmatic condition. And that makes sense to me. I mean, if you have uh, early diagnosis, you want to avoid further exposure. Yep, it does. Yeah. And then, of course, you have your drugs, always drugs. 
So the similar treatment to other forms of asthma, basically, as far as I can tell, it's going to be things like bronchodilators, uh, inhalers, things that you would normally see in asthma treatment. Again, that's going to follow the recognized, published, established medical guidelines that exist outside the work comp board for asthma treatment. And patients uh, with sensitized induced OA should be removed from further exposure uh, to the causative agent in addition to providing other asthma management. Okay. So when a claimant or yeah, when a claimant with a <clears throat> work exacerbated asthma can no longer tolerate a work setting, the clinician and the claimant should carefully balance the potential benefit of removal from work with the benefits, financial and psychological, of continuing to work. So it sounds like it's going to be a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation discussing the pros and cons of staying to work and not staying in work. And this, I think, is aimed more at the doctors than anybody. I mean, this is a discussion between the doctor and the claimant. Uh, and, you know, it's hopefully documented, but it's going to be a discussion, like Neil just said, about whether or not the claimant should stay in work and is capable of continuing to work. And if the claimant can't be removed, they should be relocate, relocated somewhere else within the plant or the building. Um, even low exposure can worsen the disease. And if that happens, you have to remove the, the claimant re completely from the exposure, not just relocate them or other means. Um, you can try personal protection equipment. And in any case, it, there needs to be increased medical surveillance which I would assume, and not assume, I, I would imagine is uh, regular reporting of the claimant's condition. Um, and if it's getting worse, then the doctor is encouraged to remove the claimant from the exposure. Right, so I mean, I would expect, like Neil just said, regular reports from the doctor detailing uh, the symptoms, the treatment, the response to the treatment. Right. I mean, this is not something I would expect where you're gonna have big gaps in treatment because this is pretty clear. There needs to be regular, consistent surveillance here. Correct. Yep. Um, this is the medical treatment guidelines reminding physicians to uh, inform the presence of exposure to the causal, causal agent is likely to result in a deterioration of asthma symptoms and airway obstruction. So that's if they're staying by the of persistence of the exposure or avoidance of the exposure, the medical professional would inform the claimant. Uh, the complete avoidance to exposure is associated with the highest probability of improvement, but may not lead to a complete recovery of asthma. I keep doing that, I'm sorry. There we go. So, uh, Medical removal, uh, once the diagnosis is confirmed, uh, they should be um, removed from the exposure. Um, I think here the big takeaway is, um, you know, the decision to be taken out of work versus all the other means that we had just, dis that I had just discussed, such as moving locations, increasing your medical monitoring. Yeah, um, so. I think that um, really the focus here is, is that and, you know, if possible, minimize exposure. So, I mean, if, if they can do something else that doesn't involve exposure to the irritating agent, great. They should be able to do that, hypothetically anyway. But you're going to have to, you know, your assurers are going to have to be very careful about exposure to these agents that are causing the problems because it may just make things worse. Right. And so a sensitizer induced asthma, the recommendation is to be removed from the exposure. Um, the irritant induced asthma, uh, they say they recommend to reduce to the lowest levels possible, including the use of um, personal protection equipment, uh, but also noted that there should be careful monitoring to ensure uh, early identification of the worsening of the asthma, progression of the asthmatic condition should prompt a total removal from the exposure. And I think that's a good practice. I mean, that makes sense. Um, they then go into discussion of respiratory protective devices. And they are generally not recommended. 
And honestly, that kind of surprised me. <laughs> that surprised me too. Um, however, they can be uh, they can be used in mild cases in lower exposure settings on short term basis in conjunction with other efforts to reduce or eliminate exposure and with pharmacological treatment and therapy, especially in irritant induced occupation asthma. Treatment doesn't really differ. They didn't get into different. Um, they didn't get into too many different types of medications, uh, but it basically just said that they should follow the uh, standard treatment protocol. Um, Anti-asthma medications alone shouldn't be uh, used. It should be used in conjunction with other interventions, such as removal. Um, so the medications didn't really differ from the normal type of treatment. They didn't, but what I thought interesting was it does say that immunotherapy may be appropriate if, and I'm pretty sure it's only if, the occupational asthma is due to a specific allergen. Uh, and then it went on to discuss some of the treatments. So I'm thinking this is not going to be a lot of cases, but it is certainly something that you may run into that may be appropriate based on the allergen that is causing the asthma and the reaction. Okay. Um, treatment is also pretty, pretty short. It's actually just this. So um, they recommend a flu shot, immunization, um, pneumonia, um, they recommend, obviously, to monitor for acute flare-ups, aggressive management of respiratory infections, specific management of allergic and irritant comorbidities on, of the upper respiratory tract. So it's just basically keeping, in, keep, keeping your treatment going. I think it's interesting they recommended the flu vaccine. <laughs> that and the pneumonia vaccine. Yeah. All right. So the prognosis, oh, that other one's kind of hard to read. <clears throat> um, what the takeaway is, is improvement or resolution of symptoms or preventing deterioration is more likely in workers who have no further exposure to the causative agent, relative normal, relatively normal lung function at the time of the diagnosis, and a shorter duration of symptoms prior to the diagnosis. So it can become a chronic condition, um, and the symptoms might not uh, ever go away, but there are ways to control it, and the controlling it is the treatment um, and medications and um, other types of adjustments. Okay. So, so the, it, as we've said all the way through, the guidelines are really focusing on elimination and substitution. This is the best strategy to eliminate exposure. And I think, you know, unfortunately, once there is a case and it's identified, then it can be remedied at the assured. I think that's the best way to go about it as opposed to just trying to uh, go around it. So there's other ways, though. Um, engineering controls, which is eliminating the potential exposure without the need for the employees to participate in. I would imagine that's uh, remedial things, such as chain, you know, updating the ventilation system, things yep. of that nature. Um, administrative controls, that's work practices, uh, involve the processes to minimize exposure. If there's a better way of doing something to minimize the exposure that the employer and employees can implement, then that's what's recommended. Personal protective equipment relies on the employees to use, uh, to use to decrease exposure. However, it is still considered less effective than eliminating or minimizing exposures at the source of or the environment. So that is the last slide. I, um, Vicki, thank you for joining me today. That was great. Thank um, you. This was a really uh, overview of a detailed topic, but again, I think some of the big takeaways like we've been going over the whole time is to make sure that the doctors are documenting everything on both sides 
I think it's important then to, um, if we need a comprehensive IME cover letter, that that be addressed. Um, I also think that we're going to be need, we need to be more involved with our assureds to get the information, the material safety data sheets, the industrial hygiene. So it might be a little bit more of a hands-on type of case, but it's outlined fairly well, given that it's the board. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Neil. Um, so if you want to open up the uh, seminar or the conference to um, questions, all you have to do is click on the participants uh, button again down at the bottom and select unmute all and then we can ask our audience if they have any questions for you. Okay. Ah. Did you find it? Kind of. I can reclaim host and do it if you want me to. Manage participants, unmute all. Okay, so go. Super. So if anybody has any questions, you're all unmuted now. So you should be able to ask a question of Neil and Vicki. Hi, this is James. So we had carpal tunnel guidelines that talked a lot about changing standards to causation, et cetera, et cetera. And um, after a while, the board started rejecting those, saying that they didn't believe that they had the authority to change sort of the rules of engagement of comp in general through guidelines. Do you believe that that might be, um, that that might be the case here, given that they've changed, they, they appear to have changed the standard for sufficient medical evidence, et cetera, to even bring a case in the first instance, or at least get it going? Um, I do. I think that this is certainly more outlined of what's expected for for a doctor to document as opposed to the, what we usually see with an elbow injury that based upon the <coughs> medical history that the elbow is related. I think here it's going to take way more. It's going to take more to show to bring the claim. I do think it's going to take more. Right. But this smells like the carpal tunnel guidelines that the board ultimately rejected after a couple of years of trying to hang on to those higher standards. I mean, do, do you see enough analogy there or are we just going to wing in a prayer and a hope on this one? Well, I think we could probably distinguish um, asthma cases, which are few and far between compared to the carpal tunnel stuff that we, that we encounter. I mean, I, for one, have, I maybe have handled a couple of asthma cases over the course of a 20 plus year career. So perhaps it's not as well entrenched with the forceful typing that uh, has led, that historically led to the establishment of carpal tunnel claims and has again, despite the guidelines suggesting that that wouldn't be sufficient. Right, so I think the number of claims is gonna be a little, is gonna be lower and so that we'll see less, we'll see litigation, but it would probably be just trickling in. Yeah, I just, I guess I would hope that asthma as a condition is not as well in, as established at the board with respect to causation as something like carpal tunnel was. But it's a good point, James. I mean, we may, you know, go in there armed with these new guidelines thinking that it's mm -hmm. going to be different this time. <laughs> Wonderful. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Well, super. I really appreciate the effort that you guys put into this. Thank you so much. Neil was uh, his, like his first time uh, doing lead and uh, very well done. Uh, next month, everybody should tune in because it's one of our most popular webinars every year. We'll be doing uh, the case law update. Um, and James um, has uh, done this traditionally and has done a great job and um, has been has been has volunteered to do it again, um, and so we'll look forward to that. And that will be the, I believe, the fourth Friday of January, correct? Yes. So that's the twenty second. I don't have my calendar. Stay tuned for the announcement. As always, it will come in the form of an invitation from Najee Walker in our office, whom we should give a shout out to for um, supporting us with um, his technical expertise. 
So thanks again, everybody. Um, we appreciate that your attendance and um, have a wonderful holidays. And uh, I, for one, am eagerly anticipating 2021 arriving. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. <laughs>